a second. Uh, I'm getting there. Uh, not as spry as I used to be. Oh, hey, everybody. It's been so long since I've seen you all. Oh, oh, and Barry, you waited for me these long, long days. My faithful companion. Okay, hey, everybody, how you doing? Ta Okay, hey everybody, how you doing? Techie 101 here, and uh, wow, that was a wait, was it not? That was 20 days, but hey, you can't exactly control when you get sick, and I'm glad Oda is feeling a lot better from what I heard. Uh, I hope he takes uh, I hope he takes some little rests whenever he gets sick like that, because I hear Oda's sleeping schedule especially is like really, really rough for him. It's, it's hard being a mangaka. I know he wanted to get to a chapter 1000 by the end of the year, but that's probably not going to happen now, but hey, you know what? That's fine. Chapter 1000 can happen whenever it's important that he's feeling better okay so this will be chapter 992 of one piece at long last and next week there is no break so that's good and we're getting this early this week an early shonen jump release uh before we get even into the chapter though this will be chapter 992 titled remnants i wanted to cover the uh cover of shonen jump this week i think i could show that i could show the cover of the magazine right so this is actually really interesting because we got luffy and yamato here and i believe this is the first time we actually get to see uh yamato's uh, color palette. I don't think Oda's ever revealed that before, which is very interesting. So Yamato um, has red horns and also a lot of the fan art I've seen of Yamato depict him with uh, green hair. I've seen like a lot of like lime green hair, but uh, here we have white hair and then it kind of like fades down into like a um, bluish green kind of color palette near the end. Um, so it's interesting because Kaido has black hair. I'm not sure if Yamato dyes it or anything, but we don't know anything about Yamato's mother. Um, but we know, you know, Kaido has black hair, of course, so it's, it's, it's interesting there. I wonder who the mother of Yamato is going to end up being, but I believe this is the first time we ever get to see that, so that's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. We don't get a lot of Yamato in this chapter. We only get, like, one scene with him, but still pretty neat. And moving on, unfortunately, we do not get a continuation of Beiji's Oh My Family this week, although, fortunately, we do get a pretty cool color spread that features the Straw Hats hanging out on the sea train, uh, just having a nice mid-afternoon snack. Also, it kind of shows the official color palette for Enma, which, uh, hold on, where's Enma? Enma is right here, and uh, this is the thing that I was kind of dreading. I was kind of disappointed in it, actually, a little bit, uh, because I think there was another color spread where we saw Enma with a purple hilt, and I was like, oh, is it purple? Because there was another color spread that Oda did that was, I think, a Tonko Bond cover, and we see Enma, and I believe it was with a black hilt, so implying the whole sword was like this, like, you know, a black, sh black scabbard, black hilt, and everything. But here, no, it's, it's very clearly right there in the foreground. It is a purple hilt, purple scabbard, uh, Edma is a purple sword. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that. It's kind of resembling the Nidai Katetsu a little bit there. It doesn't have the stripes that the Nidai does, but yeah, I, I'm assuming that's the official color palette Oda's going with. Maybe he was bouncing back and forth on which one he was really trying to decide upon. I thought, you know, personally, it was going to be like, you know, a yin and yang sort of deal, you know, black and white, you know, that was the whole concept behind, you know, the Ame no Hamakiri and Enma, but, you know, right there, it, it's not even something you could say that, like, Enma Enma's way in the background, and Oda just colored it in, and it's like you can barely see it. No, it's like all three of uh, Zoro's swords are right there in the foreground, so I guess we gotta paint this sword now. I guess purple, a light purple is what we're going with here. I mean, either way, it doesn't matter. Zoro's a badass, but it'll probably be purple in the anime coming out, so I guess, uh, I guess we'll see where this goes. Oh! Oh, I wonder if... No, okay. I don't know. This is me. Th maybe this was the case. What if the anime department kind of screwed up? Because I don't think Enma has appeared yet in the anime. Um, but what happened if, like, the anime department made it purple and then Oda found out about it later and he's like, well, it's not purple, it's supposed to be black. And they're like, oh, well, we can't change it now. Uh, I mean, I guess we could change it, but there's some episodes where it's already purple. So I guess we could change it from purple to black in the mid-episode, but then that would be weird. And maybe Oda was like... Okay, fine, whatever, I'll just make it purple in the manga. And like, may maybe, I don't know, maybe that's how that could have worked? I don't know, it's just it's just weird, because he did draw it as black before, so that's weird. But okay, whatever. Doesn't really matter, I guess it's just the color palette of a sword. Only I would really care about that, but whatever. Continuing on here, um, we start off the chapter in front of Onigashima, so like the main entrance, where the giant skull, you know, Muffin Mountain entrance is, and the giant katana sticking out of the ground, you know, where the sunny and all the ships arrived, and then they sank. You know, we're in that area, right? So Big Mom is there. I guess, I guess Robin and uh, Jean 
Shibei's uh, combo attack just had her tumbling down the balcony of the, the Golden Kagura Hall, and then she slammed onto the floor, and like a freaking cartoon character, she just rolled all the way back to the entrance. Like, there's a lot of steps there. I guess you just keep walking the steps up, and you eventually hit the Golden Kagura Hall. So maybe that's what Robin did. She did the Delphinium thing, rolled her off of the side, hit the stairs, and she's like, Oh, no, damn it! Oh, oh, no, no, come on, damn it, damn it, damn it! And she's just falling down like 13 stories of steps, finally slams into the freaking uh, entrance of Onigashima. She's like, ah, oh, I am going to kill them when I get back up there. And then uh, we have Pero Sparrow and Marco arriving because remember it was stated that they apparently were together. Um, they weren't like, you know, trying to attack each other. They were entering Onigashima, you know, together. And so I guess that's where they met up with Big Mom. And we're already kind of in the middle of this conversation. So we didn't actually get to see them like meet up with her. It's just this middle of this conversation is already in progress. And Pero Sparrow, you know, he addresses the thing that, you know, he's really concerned about. Like, Mama, are you really forming an alliance with Kaido? Like, what's going on here? Me and the rest of the crew, the rest of the family is not for that. So I don't know what, what's going on here, but I want to figure out what's, you know, what are the facts here? And uh, Big Mom's basically like, oh, Mama, 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 Pero Sparrow, do you not understand anything? It was I, it was my idea that, you know, to form an alliance with Kaido. Don't you trust me, Mama? Mama, mama. And Pero Sparrow is just like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, of course, Mama. We, we trust you. Ab absolutely. We're just a little concerned. Ah, whatever. You know, you'll do what I say if you if you want me to really be the Pirate King. Um, because Pero Sparrow says that. He's just like, you know, the reason we're following you is because we want to make you the Pirate King. Um, and you're jo joining an alliance with Kaido. So the way that Big Mom seems to imply it, she doesn't go into full detail here. And I think the reason why she doesn't go into full detail is pretty much just because she's, you know, she's the matriarch of the family. She's like, I don't have to give you details. It's just like, I'm the one that wanted the alliance. It's my plan. Don't worry about it. I got this settled. You don't need to worry. You don't need to, you know, ask me questions. I don't need to explain anything to you you guys, you know, and so Pero Sparrow is, of course, intimidated by that. He's, he's a little nervous there. He's like, ah, uh, yeah, okay, okay, mama, sure, sure, yeah, okay, yeah, you got it all locked down. You're, you're set. So I guess that implies that Big Mom might have been attempting to, like, double-cross Kaido at some point, or, like, it was all her master plan from the beginning, like, join in an alliance with Kaido, and then wait until after the, um, you know, the fire Festival was concluded, and all that stuff's going on, and I guess maybe sneak off, steal his Poneglyph, his road Poneglyph, and then get out of Wano, or maybe defeat Kaido along the way. I'm, I'm not really sure where this is going here, but it does seem that, you know, Big Mom, there was more to this than just ally with Kaido and then work with him all the way to become the Pirate King, or like they both become the Pirate King. It might have been something way further down the line. It might have been like, join up with Kaido, do all the hard work while Kaido is helping you out, and then right at the very end, right when they find Laugh Tail in the One Piece, that's when Big Mom double crosses Kaido and then, you know, kills him or something and figures out some way to do that or, you know, uh, seal him away or something. I don't know, throw him into the ocean, and then Big Mom becomes the Pirate King. It could have been something like that, but um, we don't get the full story here. Now, Marco is also there, and you might think that, like, would, would, would Big Mom be, like, mad that, like, Marco is there, like, another enemy, a member of the Whitebeard crew? But no, Marco actually, um, and Big Mom, they kind of talk, like, not, they're not friends, but they're, like, you know, they're acquaintances. They know of each other, of course. You know Whitebeard probably clashed with Big Mom a bunch of times back in the day, and Marco's been on the crew since he was, like, 15 years old, so you know Marco would be acquainted with Big Mom and everything. So Marco's off to the side, and he's like, oh, um, all right, Pero Sparrow, I guess uh, your whole idea of an alliance working together doesn't really work too well, because Pero Sparrow's original idea here was like, hey, Marco, how about you work with me, and we'll take down Kaido, and then Marco's like, yeah, sure, okay, I guess we could do that, but then here's Big Mom saying, you know, no, the alliance still stands, I'm with Kaido right now, and Marco's like, oh, okay, well, I guess we're not taking down Kaido, or at least we're not ally, I'm not ally allying with you in taking down Kaido. All right, whatever. And so Marco's pretty nonchalant about it. He doesn't really seem upset. He's just like, all right, I guess I'll just get going then. You guys do your own thing. Meanwhile, you have Big Mom looking down at Marco and like, Marco, I'm I'm uh, very, uh, you know, interested in why you would fight alongside those kids, you know, the Straw Hats and everything. You know, why would you ally with them? Uh, she brings up Whitebeard and she brings up like, how 
how the the remnants of Whitebeard's crew, that's probably where the chapter title comes from, why the remnants of Whitebeard's crew would be acting in this fashion. They've they've certainly uh, fallen, you know, the former commanders and everything. And uh, Marco basically looks right at Big Mom, right in her face, and he just like, uh, he kind of smiles, and he's just like, you really don't know what the term remnants means, right? You know, we used to all be members of Whitebeard's crew. Sure, he was our father. We all respected the man, but he's dead now. All right, we do. We do not follow the wills and wishes of you know uh, someone that's dead. We are all free now. And Big Mom, I I in some translations, uh, they go with the uh, Ah, dead men tell no tales, mama, mama, mama. And I understand why a lot of translations did that because that's a very piratey esque thing to say. Dead men tell no tales, matey. Except if you be Brooke, he's a skeleton. You know, like yeah, yeah, Brooke is a dead man, and he does indeed tell tales, right? So I get why they went with that for translation's sake, but a more accurate tra a translation in that particular instance would have been something like, um, would have been something like, you know, dead men give no orders, you know, in that situation. So Big Mom kind of says it, and she's like, ah, dead men give no orders, you're correct, you know, you know, Whitebeard no longer bosses you around, very well, do whatever you desire, mum, 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 mum. And so that's how that conversation pretty much ends. It doesn't end with, like, you know, Pero Sparrow, like, immediately turning on Marco, and he's like, well, okay then, Mama, I guess if we're working together, let's kill Marco, or Big Mom being like, ah, Marco, I will Will crush you no it's it's pretty much they're all on even kill and i like what um i like what marco said i really do he's just like listen um it, it's almost like implying that whitebeard had to talk to them about this before like what would what would his wishes be for the crew if he ever died because whitebeard was getting old and he had this disease right so i, I don't think it's too um far-fetched to claim that at one point maybe he called in his most trusted commanders like the ones that have been on the crew for the longest like he called in marco joe Ozu, Vista, the ones that have been on the crew for the longest time, and he's like, you know, come on in here, come on in here, guys, come on, sit down. And he's like, okay, what's up, Pops? And he's like, ah, sit down, have some sake. Glug, glug, glug. Ugh, listen up, kids, you know, I'm... I'm not going to be around forever. And then, of course, they're like, oh, Pops, don't talk like, ah, no, no, go, go, go. listen, listen, listen. I'm not going to be around forever. And I just want to let you kids know that when I'm gone, you know, I don't want you to, you know, carry on, you know, whatever thing I'm doing, you know, like, like your lives is, is yours to have, you know, you can do whatever you desire after that, you're all going to be free, you know, you can carry on with the pirate life if you want, but if you don't, you know, I'm not going to hold you against that, I'm not going to, like, curse you from beyond the grave or anything, I'm not going to make you do something that you don't want to do, or don't, like, like, um, you know, chase after my, you know, don't, don't, don't fight for my will once I'm dead, basically, like, it might have been something that Whitebeard might have said, right? Because um, he wanted a family at the end of the day, Whitebeard, and I think the way that he would have viewed it is, you know, I want my kids to be free to, you know, choose their own paths after I'm gone, right? And this might have even have been before the war. I, I could totally see that. In fact, that was actually even implied in an SBS once. Remember, Whitebeard had all those, like, really sexy nurses working on his crew, you know, hooking up all the equipment and everything. Somebody actually asked an SBS question once of, like, hey, uh, what happened to those nurses, right? And it wasn't it stated that Whitebeard doesn't have, like, he doesn't let women fight on his crew or something so what was up with the nurses and um oda explained he's like well yeah yeah he doesn't and he had like a very tearful goodbye to all of the nurses before he went to marine ford so whitebeard definitely planned that he might not have survived that he's like this might be very well i'm going up against the entire force of the marines you know the admirals fleet admiral everything i mean yeah we got my crew we got all the commanders yeah we got all the allied ships and everything um but at the end of the day, this I'm, I'm, I'm old and this might not end well. So uh, maybe he, you know, sent all the nurses and, you know, made his will and everything, you know, setting everything up. And then he sat down with Marco and Vista and Jozu, all of the oldest members of the crew, and he's like told them his wishes. Might have been something like that. And so the way Marco says it, he's just like, you know, I'm here of my own free will. And he, I mean, hey, it also kind of implies the other commanders might show up. I mean, maybe indirectly it does. He's like, hey, we're all free to make our own path. Maybe Vista might show up. Maybe Jozu might show up and be like, it was our freedom to choose to come here. We're here. You know, Marco can no longer boss them around. The Whitebeard crew is disbanded. But yeah, so that, that was an interesting moment there. I kind of wish I would have gotten to see the full breadth of that conversation and how Big Mom ran into Perispera and Marco, but I understand. We got to kind of move this along. We cut over to Carrot and Wanda very briefly. Finally, some Carrot's getting some time to shine here. And Carrot's like, oh, 
I saw that man that killed Pedro. She cracks her, her rabbit knuckles, you know, puts on her gauntlets and sh electros up and she's like, I'll be right back, Wanda. And she starts sprinting toward the entrance to Onigashima because she saw Pero Sparrow there. Wanda's right behind her. So we're going to have Carrot and Wanda go up against Pero Sparrow, get some righteous revenge for what went down at Totland with Pedro and everything. So that is getting set up. Uh, then we cut over to Luffy very briefly. I think this is the only time we get to see Luffy in the chapter. He's just running through a crowd and they're like, hey, Straw! Hat, you should try to jump up again and that's pretty much all we get from Luffy you know people are still trying to help him to get up to the roof but you know it's it's slow going because there's a lot of really powerful gifters in the hall we get another few scenes throughout the castle one of which being uh, Shinobu still running with Momonosuke still looks like Shinobu does not trust Yamato even though Luffy kind of shouted over oh by the way Shinobu yeah Yamato that's Kozuki Odin just roll with it you guys can trust him and so uh, Shinobu still running doesn't really look like she's like you know I don't know if I can trust that person back there um, but Momo, on the other hand, Momo is not freaked out like, what? Kozuki Odin? What? You're my dad? No, Momo is kind of just looking back at Yamato like, hmm. You know, so he kind of gives the expression of, like, maybe Momo will tell Shinobu, like, I think we can trust uh, him. I think we'll be okay. I guess he is Kozuki Oda. Let's just roll with it. Why not? There's a lot of weird stuff going on today. My dad came back from the dead. That's fine. Let's just roll with that. Okay. So well, we just get one brief scene with them. And now we cut over to Black Maria. Black Maria is in another part of the hallway. Um, not the hallway hallway, like the hallway of everything. She's in another room um, with, a, with a bunch of, I, I guess they might be the escorts from the brothel, because uh, Black Maria own the brothel and so she's there and she's strumming a uh, a biwa and she's singing a song about two lovers that meet on a uh, snow-capped mountaintop you know like these two lovers that you know they couldn't be together but then one night they met each other atop this uh this uh, romantic snowy mountain kind of landscape and so she's singing the song on the biwa there um i can't really do it myself uh the only thing every time i hear or even see someone like strumming that instrument I, my mind immediately flashes back to the episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. You know the one? Tales of Ba Sing Se. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this. Leaves from the vine. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what immediately my mind goes to with like that, that, that stringed instrument. Like, leaves from the vine falling so slow. Like fragile, tiny shell. Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna make you all remember that, although you already are at this point. That was a sad episode, but um, yeah, that, that's immediately what my mind goes to, so whatever. Anyway, this serves as like the backdrop to what's gonna happen next. What's gonna happen next? We're gonna see a balls-out fight between the Scabbards and Kaido. That's what we're gonna see next. Can't show you any panels of it, but trust me, read the chapter. It's freaking awesome. All right, so you got this strumming, this instrument, this song in the background and then we actually cut to the snow-capped mountaintops of Muffin Mountain where we have Kaido going up against the scabbards and it is an amazing two-page spread. All of the scabbards are charging right at Kaido. This is apparently right after Kinemon sliced the Boro breath and they're like ah and then Kaido he kind of like falls down like here's the surface of the mountain and he just kind of dives right there and he's just like Wah! and he's heading right for him like this giant snake dragon duck heading right toward everybody and he opens his mouth to roar but he's He's not doing a boro breath this time. No, this time he just lets out such a mighty roar, lightning actually gets discharged from his mouth. Like actual lightning bolts come out of his mouth and strike the ground and break it apart. Um, that doesn't hurt any of the scabbards though. They all managed to jump and you know dodge out of the way there. So they did good on that dexterity save right there. So they all jump and everybody kind of gets a chance to use a certain like specific attack. It's great. It's really cool. So first thing we have uh, Nekamamushi that kind of like he spins in the air. He literally just jumps and then spins like a drill and uses um, uh, the, the crimson cat dance. So he like literally spins like a drill with Electro, you know, geared up and everything and just slams into Kaido. Bam! Scratches him with that. Then you have uh, uh, then you have Kawamatsu jumping up and uses Kappa style, um, which one translation is like Sea of the River, but another one I really like more is Milky Way. So he like kind of spins up and uses Kappa style with his sword. I think Sotsumo is the name of his sword. And he basically just the way that it's drawn whenever Kawamatsu does like the yeah, the attack it like sends shock waves out like ripples like at the epicenter of his sword which I think is the inspiration there one of the translations implies like a river it's kind of like you know you throw a stone into a, a, a pond or a lake and it ripples out and so there's like ripples coming from his sword swing it implies the way it looks 
if Kaido wasn't like this super durable dragon god, if this was just like a regular opponent, they would be sliced in half by this thing. Like the ripples would come out and just like slice you apart. But in this instance, like Kaido like opens his mouth to go just like devour Kalamatsu and Kalamatsu just like shing and then swipes. And then the ripple goes like right in between Kaido's jaw and it causes him to bleed. Same thing with Nekamamushi's attack. All of the scabbard's attacks in this chapter by Kaido's own omission do do damage to him, alright? It's not even a thing where it's like, oh, I can just shrug off the attacks like they're nothing, right? Um, so next up we have, uh, uh, what's next up? Well, oh, actually, Kaido does manage to hit Kawamatsu. He does take his, uh, one, uh, his talon and slams Kawamatsu into the side of a wall. But next up we have, uh, uh, Inu Arashi that comes up with his attack, and he takes his sword leg, his sword peg leg, and just rams it right into the side of Kaido's body. That's charged up with Electro, hits him, you know, just like, Shah! and then Kaido's, like, roaring there. Um, next up we have, uh, uh, uh Okiku and, um, Izo using a combo attack. She uses like these sickle blades um, like of snow. Um, I'm sure they might just be like, you know, once again, like she swings the sword really fast so they send out like air blades. I think it might be something with that. And then Izo uses uh, uh, perforation bullets or like slicing bullets is the translation, okay? So um, that might, uh, it's interesting enough for Kiku doing that technique and of course she's oh Kiku of the lingering snow so it's like, you know, snow chakrams that she's sending out toward Kaido but then you have Izo using a special technique with his flintlocks, okay? So I like to think it's kind of like, you know, uh, Izo has, like, special bullets or something that he can load into his guns and then fire them off, you know, kind of like kind of like Verona from the One Piece D&D that I'm playing with Rustage. We just did a session last night, actually. It was a lot of fun. Um, so so kind of like that, where Izo has, like, a bunch of these special bullets lined up, like, they're regular bullets, and he's got, like, these slicing bolts that do um, slicing damage instead of, like, blunt damage or piercing damage. They, like, slice up the opponent. And so they do a combo attack there, and they they attack Kaido, they hit him like right up here, right by the head, he's bleeding, he takes some damage, and the entire time Kaido, he's kind of like, he's inhaling to do another uh, Boro breath, to do another blast breath attack, but while he's inhaling, while he's like, <gasps> he's like, these attacks are so puny compared to Odin, so why, why are they hurting me so much? You know, it doesn't imply like he's so damaged, like he can barely even move. He's not taking that much damage, but he's taking damage. That's the thing that's screwing with him right now. It's just like these attacks are not Odin level. I, that's also something I find funny is like the way Kaido views it. Only Odin would be capable of hurting him because he's the only one that really ever scarred him. You know, Odin is the one that left the scar on him with his Togen Totsuka, with his, you know, mighty Odin two sword style. And uh, because that's the only time Kaido Kaido's ever really been injured in any major way. He views it like only Kozuki Odin could hurt me and Kozuki, Oda, Kozuki Odin's dead and these guys aren't Kozuki Odin so how the hell are they making me bleed? So uh, he charges up his Boro breath and this is where we get the man, the myth, the legend. That's right ladies and gents, it is time for Rizo of the Mist to show us what he's got. I did a scabbard poll a couple months back. Who's the most popular scabbard um, out of all of the nine? I think I even included Izo on there too. And Rizo ranked the lowest. You know, the absolute lowest. Like, it wasn't even really close. He got like 4%. But here's Rizo right here. Okay, so last time Kinemon sliced it. So, I'm not really sure why Kaido's doing the Boro Breath thing again. I mean, maybe he thinks I could just get lucky and maybe this time Kinemon won't cut it. But he uses the Boro Breath. Raizo jumps in, takes out a ninja scroll, a giant ninja scroll, unfurls it. The scroll absorbs the entirety of this attack. Once again, Boro Breath, an attack that leveled the peak of a mountain that obliterated the entire the countryside and the castle and everything. Just Boom! It is a giant, fiery, death ball laser beam. Raizo just, whoo! Ha! Sealing no jutsu! And it just gets sealed in the scroll. The scroll furls up, and Raizo's like, there is not a thing in this world that cannot be sealed by my ninja scrolls! Allow me to now return it to you, Mr. Kaito. Hoo, hoo, hoo. We shall do. Boro breath, return jutsu! And so he takes out the entire scroll, wraps it around Kaido's body, and then it just returns the attack, close range, point blank, spreads it all over his body, like, wraps it around him and just boom, 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 boom! Giant explosion as Raizo strikes an epic, like, ho! ninja pose at the base of it as this giant explosion. You know, Boro breath, 
reversal or return, you know? God, that was cool. That was cool. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Rizo, I gotta give you the MVP of the of the chapter. I got to, man. I mean, I know. There's a lot of really other cool scenes here. We even got a scene with Carrot. Um, you know, Nekamimushi, Inu Arashi. I like the Kawamatsu attack, you know. I liked uh, Kiku and Izo's combining attacks. That was cool. But come on. You, even if you're not a fan of Rizo, you, you got... He went legit into this. He went the full nine yard. He busted out some Naruto moves here, right? He did the scroll. He did the hand signs. He did no jutsu. He struck the pose. <laughs> he struck the pose. It was like an action movie scene where he wraps the thing around Kaido, turns the opposite direction, whoo, and then boom in the background. Like, damn, that was epic. I also have to say, there is that thing that he says, like, you know, I can contain anything. Anything can be sealed or wrapped up in my scroll. I'm like, all right, then um, wrap it around Kaido, right? Just, just wrap it around his whole body and just stuff him into a scroll. And then, like, like you, know, you don't even have to light it on fire or anything. Just wrap him in a scroll and just tie it really tight. And then, all right, that, that was easy. Just put it in your breast pocket and just walk away. There, there you go. That was easy. Took out Kaido. Sealed forever. You know, he's not dead, but he's not coming back, so whatever. Uh, probably, probably limitations to that. I don't think they could exactly do that, but that was a pretty epic scene, you got to admit. So, uh, Kaido takes damage. All of the remaining uh, beast pirates that are still on the... There's a few remnants of, like, Jack's forces that haven't died yet. <laughs> they're, they're still around, and they're lying around the battlefield, and they're just like, you know, uh, Jack himself, I guess. I guess they're on, like, a like, way to the side, like, healing Jack or patching him up, and they're watching this, and like, how is Kaido taking this much damage? This is absurd! Um, and then the last scene of the chapter, we have yet to see Denjiro, Ashura Doji, Kinemon, and, uh, well, no, Inarashi, we saw him do something, but he does something else here, too, so it's the four of them, okay? It's Ashura, Kinemon, Denjiro, and Inuarashi. We get a brief flashback to Odin, and Odin has a moment where he wanted to teach his disciples the, you know, Odin two-sword style, the Nitoryu style that he practiced, and... Um, none of the other scabbards seem to be really interested in learning it. And that's the thing that kind of annoyed Odin. He's like, why don't you want to learn the Odin two-sword style? It's the most in it's the most intense and the strongest sword style in all of the land. And they just weren't interested. However, that's not really the reason why they didn't want to learn it. We now cut over to another scene, another flashback involving Odin and Toki, where Odin is, like, lamenting to Toki, like, how come they don't want to learn my fighting style, Toki? I'm the best! And Toki's like, oh, you know, dear Odin, it's not that they don't want to learn it, it's that if they did learn it, they would obviously fight each other to prove who's the strongest using it, right? Like, it's like Odin teaches all of them the two-sword style. You know all that's going to happen is they're going to end up getting into a fight to see who's the strongest and who deserves to be the number one Odin two-sword style disciple of Odin, right? Because Odin is such an amazing man among men, you know, he's like, oh, they would literally fight and die for you to prove this, right? So now we cut back to the present where we see Keen, Ashura, Denjiro, and Inorashi all practicing the two-sword Odin style at the same time. They all take out their swords. Hold on, let me just, actually, let me do this. I am also a practitioner of the two-sword Odin style. Try not to, okay, here we go. It's like, whoo! You know, and so they all strike the pose just like Odin did back in the day. Kaido looks at them and he's like, A cheap imitation of a great man in a great sword style. You have no hope of beating me. And he goes to attack. He's like taking them all down, like staring them all down. And then we get the last scene of the chapter where... And Kaido opens his mouth to do another Boro breath or maybe another lightning attack, whatever. And then all four of them jump up and at the same time, Togen Totska times four quadruple the pain. And then boom, they all, I don't know how the hell they all managed to time this perfectly, but they managed to time this perfectly. All four of their attacks, every single one of them, hits the scar that Odin originally left on Kaido as just a perfect sense of, like, poetry and symbolism. It's just like, shing, 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 all at different points right on top of each other, and the combined damage of their combo attack causes the scar to open up and start bleeding. 
It's not a tremendous amount of blood. It's not like a giant geyser of blood is erupting out of Kaido, but he is bleeding. And of course, we've already established the scar is sort of like a weakness for him where, you know, even before the fight even really got started when he was falling off of the balcony, he's like, why is the scar throbbing? So you know this entire fight while Kaido's been, you know, clashing with the scabbards, that scar, even though they haven't been aiming for the scar, that scar's probably been throbbing him. You know, just the memory of Odin himself. And uh, now that they struck it directly, not once, not twice, not thrice, but quite qu quad twice, quadruple times, um, that damage is going to add up. Next chapter is going to start off with Kaido letting out some death throws. I mean, he's not going to die, but he's going to be, he's going to be in some serious pain. And I think he's going to be in so much damn pain next chapter, he might actually go back to his original form, or maybe his hybrid, because we've yet to see that. Um, but I think that damage is definitely going to get to him. That pain is definitely going to get to him after Absolutely. He's going to be like, Aah! he's going to be like thrashing around the mountain and like damaging part of the horns of Onigashima. And then it's like going to be slapping the ground and then the scabbards are going to back off like, whoa, whoa, okay, this is crazy. We got to get, can't even get close to him when he's like this. And then finally he's going to like turn back into his original form, you know, the big hulking like Oni man form. And he's going to be walking toward him. He's like, all right, fine. You want me to fight you like you were all Odin? Fine, I'll fight you like you you were Odin, you know? Let, let's just be straight up at this point. Um, I kind of think the whole dragon thing, I mean, it's cool, it's impressive, it's a giant dragon, but kind of just makes Kaido an easier target. You know what I mean? Like, at this point, like, I think the smart thing to do would kind of go back to your regular form and bust out the Kanabo. The Kanabo worked great on everybody else. I think the Kanabo, I'm just saying, like, if Kawamatsu takes a Kanabo, like a Thunderbolt, right to the face, um, I don't know if Kawamatsu would be able to just get up after that. I don't know if any of them would be able to just get up after that, after taking a Bagara right to the face. They might, because they've been training a while. Like, maybe Ashura could take one, and he gets knocked out for a few minutes, and he's like, he gets back up, but he's all bloodied, but he could still fight. Maybe. But that, I think, would do a lot of damage, right? And also, he's not a giant dragon, and I know the giant dragon thing, Kaido probably never, he never had opposition like this before. Every time Kaido turns into a giant dragon, people run screaming in every direction, and the ones that are too foolhardy enough to stay around just get incinerated by his Boro breath, right? He never had to deal with this shit before. He turns into a dragon, pff, he nukes the town, he goes back to freaking drinking sake in Onigashima. He never had to deal with this. So, um, yeah, I think Kaido, if he's smart though at this point, whether it be because of the pain he's gonna feel from that um because that's that's gonna hit him like a lightning strike next chapter i guarantee he's gonna be in some serious agony from that attack um he's gonna have to regress or we could see him in his hybrid form which would be really cool because we've yet to see that uh maybe we could finally find out what the whole thing is is he an oni that ate the dragon fruit or is he a dragon that ate the oni fruit um does he have some other power because we've yet to even get conf confirmation that he even has a mythical zone that's the thing we assume he has a mythical zone because he's kind of the beast, but would that not be an interesting twist if we find out that he's something else altogether? Um, or he was a dragon originally, but ate like another kind of mythical zone, right? Um, you know, it, it's interesting that Oda has yet to really reveal what his devil fruit is. That's very fascinating to me personally. So we'll see where that goes. We also get another scene. It's 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 kind of in tandem with the other scene where Odin was teaching them about that. He wanted to teach them about Nitoryu. Uh, but he's like, hey guys, I'm going to teach you about Ryuo. You don't want to learn about the two sword style. All right, I'll teach you about Ryuo. The thing about Ryuo is, hey, get back here. I'm trying to teach you about this damn technique, you know? So um, I think it just proved at the end of the day that the scabbards wanted to, like, secretly learn these techniques from watching Odin, not have Odin teach them directly. They wanted to, like, learn Ryuo on their own and learn this two-sword style on their own so then they can compete to see who is the strongest, you know? And they, 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 they did this in secret, not with Odin's knowledge. And so here are the fruits of that in the battle with Kaido finally going up against um, him using Odin's techniques. Now, something else you also got to keep in mind is that at some point, Zoro and Luffy are going to get involved in this fight. At some point, I think Law and, and Kid are also going to get involved in this fight. So that 
kind of implies that at some point it's going to be Kaido maybe gaining the upper hand. I mean, at, at first we have this advantage here where the scabbards seem to be winning, but um, I think Kaido at the end of the day is going to have a lot more stamina, a lot more endurance. Um, Neko and Inu's Sulongs are not going to last forever. Um, I guess Carrot is saving hers, so that's good. Um, but yeah, their Sulongs are going to end at some point. Uh, they're going to get tired. I mean, these are really high octane attacks. They're busting out against Kaido. They're still, I mean, they still have to jump around and dodge attacks and Kaido Kalamatsu got struck, you know, head on there. So they're getting hit every now and then. They're certainly taking damage. It's not like, you know, they're just attacking him and it's just like they're not getting any damage in, in exchange. Um, you know, we see Keen and uh, Ashura here in a close-up and they look pretty. They have like bruises and some blood running down their face. Denjiro looks like he has a wound on his head. So they're definitely getting damaged in the meantime just from like the attacks and just all the large-scale debris that's getting tossed around, right? Um, but yeah, I think it's going to get to a point where uh, we might have a, a few scabbards remaining like Denjiro Jiro and Kinemon and Ashura Doji are maybe still fighting, but the others are too damaged or too injured to continue. And then Zoro, Luffy, Kid, Law, they show up and then they start fighting. Uh, we still don't know what's up with Drake. Uh, we don't touch in with uh, Zoro and Drake to see how their fight's been going, so we don't get any updates on that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, enjoy this while it lasts. In fact, this might be the high point for their battle. The Scabbards might have the high point of like, alright, we managed to deal a quadruple attack on Kaido with eight swords combined on the same location that our master did, that's pretty damn poetic. That's a pretty damn cool scene to end a chapter on, and I love it. Um, but yeah, we might very well, uh, we might very well have seen the high point of the scabbards, just the scabbards fighting against Kaido. We might have to get some other people uh, involved here, or Kaido might flip the script on them and do something that they didn't even expect he could do. So yeah, he might bust out some like Conqueror's Hockey, or might bust out, he might turn into a hybrid form, and his hybrid form is even more dangerous because it's like smaller, so it's less of a uh, target, and also all that power is packed into a smaller body and he takes out his Kanabo and like whips it around with his tail or something and just like creates a giant maelstrom tornado thing of just pure hockey thunder devastation or some shit so yeah that's uh, that sounds pretty cool let's go with that giant hockey tornado maelstrom of absolute devastation that sounds pretty damn cool for an attack name um, but yeah thanks for watching everybody hope you guys enjoyed the video and we're back at it chapter 993 will be next week Almost at a thousand, but we're probably gonna have to wait until next year for that. Ah, it's okay. We'll get there eventually. That's all that matters. And, um, you know, hope Oda gets some rest. You know, it's, his schedule as a mangaka is not easy. He doesn't sleep very much, you know. So the, the fact that he, you know, manages to get as many chapters out as he does is insane. So I hope he takes care of himself. But have a good one, everybody. This will be Teching and Barry signing out.